the voices of temptation and all of that. And Gretchen's going to ask an interesting question. She's like, I, I, I'm not sure about your religious views. What's up with your religious views? Faust kind of dances around the topic. He will admit that he's not a true believer. He's tolerant, he says, of religions. He says that God is a creative force or creative spirit. He says, I have faith in nature and human emotions. He says, call it what you will, quote unquote, happiness, heart, love, God, all the same to him. In some ways, this may be good as uh, romantic theology at the time he was writing it. Gretchen, though, will say, okay, okay, I can put up with that, but your friend, I, <laughs> I, don't, like, I don't like your friend at all. And of course, she's right. Uh, that this is one of the dark ironies. In the same way that Roderigo is right about Iago and Othello, the play, um, Gretchen is right, but she can't overcome her feelings for Faust. And in that moment, Gretchen is obviously ready to fall. She says, because Faust says, I would love to come to your room tonight. And, and Gretchen says, here's the thing. I, I, I would love for that to happen. But my mom, I live with my mom. Don't worry about it, Faust says. I've got this sleeping potion. You know, you know the, the potion is actually poison. And, and so Faust is without realizing it. Mephistopheles has appropriated this. And without realizing it, he's going to suggest Gretchen kill her own mother, which she will do. Uh, Mephistopheles shows up. And after all of this, he laughs at Gretchen's religious questions, and Mephistopheles is excited because he knows now he's not just going to get one soul, he's going to get two souls uh, tonight. Obviously, he's going to get both of them. Now, uh, this is where we recognize a poem of, you know, 1808. We're not going to get a sex scene. We're not going to get anything like that. But it's going to be clear that Faust and, and Gretchen um, do, um, you know, uh, have sex, hook up. And in the process of doing that, she's going to become pregnant. Our next scene is actually at, a, at the well. And we're going to have a very brief exchange between Gretchen and her friend Elizabeth. Elizabeth is gossiping about a fallen woman, a woman who has slept with a guy, and she thinks that the guy's going to stick around, and the guy's not going to stick around, and he's going to run off. And, 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 and then Gretchen will have this amazing set of comments where she remembers how she used to be when she held her moral standards high, and she looked down on girls who did that. But now... Not so much, because we find out Gretchen is in fact pregnant, and her guilt is now beginning to kill her. And let's put this in our notes. This will be a pivotal, pivotal message of this text, that guilt leads to terrible repercussions. The next thing, we're at a shrine in the ramparts, and here the shrine is at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Madre de la Rosa, the Mother of Sorrows. It's a little niche in the city wall. Gretchen is going to make an offering of flowers. We think about Ophelia and her flowers before she goes out to drown herself, right? Praying for divine mercy. Save me, she asks, from uh, the shame and death in one. Um, and, and obviously, we realize several months have now passed, and Faust has, in fact, deserted Gretchen, think of Hamlet deserting Ophelia, and she is with child. I've told, I, you go back to my lectures on Hamlet, I told you there is a reading of the, of, of the exchanges between Hamlet and Ophelia that in fact Ophelia is with child, right? Um, and now the next passage is night. Here we're going to have Gretchen's brother. This is Valentine. We obviously think of Laertes in, in the Ophelia story with Hamlet, and he's standing outside of her house, and he's talking about his sister's reputation, how once it was a source of tremendous pride and now it's ruined. He obviously has some idea of what's going on. He's hoping that he can catch Gretchen's lover and then he sees Faust and, and, and Mephistopheles coming uh, and so he hides. Uh, Mephistopheles will sing this crude and cruel song ridiculing Gretchen's pain and uh, Faust is only there because he wants to have more sex with, with Gretchen. He asks for more jewels. Valentine steps out, he challenges Faust. Faust, with the help of Mephistopheles, will kill Valentine, who is a soldier. And in his dying breath, and then they run away, in his dying breath, Valentine will then curse Gretchen with his dying words, right? Um, in many ways, representing, obviously, conventional morality, leaving more guilt, right, on top of Gretchen, poor Gretchen. And now Faust is really at his lowest point in the poem, right? That, one way to think about this is there's only one way up, and that is, of course to try and find some kind of redemption. The next passage is in the um, cathedral nave where Gretchen is at a service. We have this interesting evil spirit who's reproaching her hissing, right? Think about the serpent of, 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 of Milton, right? Um, and, and reproaching her with all of this guilt. Um, and of course the sleeping potion was poisoned and she's killed her mother and now of course she's abandoned herself. 
and we have this alternation between the choir's Latin hymn, the day of wrath, and the spirits hissing in her ear. And this symphonic thing that comes back and forth, we see it a number of times in this poem, it's amazing. And Gretchen, really we realize, is at the end of her rope. And she will faint at the end of this passage. And of course, Gud is able to make an observation here that the church really can't, he argues, confront, uh, can, can't really comfort the lost sinner because the church is too inflexible and of course there's this whole thing of the guilt. Um, the next is April the 30th, the uh, Valpurgis night and, and here uh, the Valpurgis night is uh, an annual gathering of witches together, okay, at the top of the Broken, which is Hearts Mountain in central Germany and we're going to have uh, uh, the, the, a collection of all the satanic, the witches, everything. Now, it's been about a year since Valentine's murder. Faust has abandoned Gretchen. We have the satanic orgy thing going on. Mephistopheles is going to guide Faust through it. Think about Virgil guiding um, Dante. And in fact, at one point, um, I mean, Kuta's in his, I mean, he knows what he's doing here. But he, he has Mephistopheles say, reach out and grab my cloak and hold on, which is exactly what Virgil says to Dante, right? We are in a different kind of inferno, obviously, in this poem. And then, uh, and then uh, Faust starts dancing with this young witch, and, and then you have this really bizarre thing that scholars have tried to figure out what's going on where a red mouse comes out of her mouth, of a, out of her mouth, why it's red, I mean, what's going on with that. But in that moment, Faust remembers Gretchen, and Faust will then see Gretchen in chains, and he begins to worry about her. Now what's going on is she's been committed by the state to capital punishment for killing her own child, their, their child, right? Mephistopheles will try to distract Faust, right? He says, come on, come on, let's go to the theater to, to a distraction. But um, here we will have the descent into hell that was promised, actually, in the prelude in the theater. And Faust will realize real love for Gretchen can't let him slip fully to the dark side. And then we are at the uh, Vapurgus' Night's Dream, as it's often called, or the Golden Wedding of Oberon and Titanian. And we get this really amazing lyrical intermission. Now, there's been a lot of debate about how and in what ways this intermission connects with the full poem. Uh, it's just some brilliant poetry. We have a series of satiric four-line verses that are directed against a whole lot of Gujas contemporaries. The poem was originally written by Gujas as a separate piece and then included later. And some scholars have pointed out that the poems, this, this part of the poem shows the influence of Shakespeare as well on Gujas. The next passage is the desolate day in the open country. Faust now knows that Gretchen is in prison. He asks Mephistopheles to help her. Mephistopheles says, no way. He says, this isn't the first girl who's been jacked for her sins, for making stupid choices, and obviously believing in men, right? Um, Faust will then grow very upset. He calls Mephistopheles a dog. He calls him a loathsome monster. Um, it's almost like it's taken him a while to figure out who Mephistopheles really is. Mephistopheles is this really witty kind of, you know, Satan, uh, a satanic figure. And he comes back and he says, you know, you humans are all the same, you know. You, you join me, um, and, and then you want to feel guilty about it. This is uh, where we'll get Baudelaire's To the Reader um, lines, right? Um, and, and, and in this moment, he reminds Faust of his responsibility in Gretchen's downfall. And then he says it, I can't save the girl. Faust comes back, he makes Mephistopheles um, try to help save Gretchen, uh, even though, of course, we know it's too late. This is the only scene, by the way, in the whole tragedy written in prose. And to that degree, you want to sit up and pay attention, obviously. Here, what do we see? Faust rediscovering, to some degree, his moral responsibility, returning to reality, accepting responsibility for his actions of before. But he still doesn't fully respect, accept responsibility, right? But we are beginning to see the power of love, and this will be one of the central messages of the poem. The next passage is night in the open country. Faust and Mephistopheles are on magic black horses flying through, um, through town past the gallows. And we have a five-line scene. This is the shortest of the, of the tragedy. And now we're in prison. And Faust with Gretchen. Think about, for example, that meeting with Aeneas and Dido in Aeneas 6 when he goes down into the underworld. Think about the exchange between Hamlet and Ophelia. Here we have Faust meeting Gretchen. She is now insane. Right? Her guilt has driven her nuts. She can't even recognize Faust, right? Gretchen has drowned their baby. She asks if she can hold her baby one last time. She thinks that Faust is, in fact, the hangman who's coming to hang her. Faust 
is grief-stricken. He cries out in, in despair, right? Suddenly, Gretchen will recognize Faust. It's a, it's, a, it's a powerful moment. She jumps up, her chains fall off, she hugs Faust, and all of a sudden, she's ready to have hope again. And Faust says, come on, come on, we gotta go. We think immediately, of course, of Plato's Crito, right? Where Crito comes in and says to Socrates, let's go, let's go, it's time to get out of prison. And of course, Socrates will say, we gotta think about this. Gretchen will say something very similar as well. Notice, um, she, will, she will say, no, no, I can't leave. I deserve the punishment that I'm gonna get. We think about Dostoevsky's crime and punishment as an analog to this idea that I, I deserve to pay for the crimes that I have committed, is Gretchen's view. And then dawn breaks, and Mephistopheles comes in and tells Faust, it's time. Um, she's condemned, and it's, and it's over. Um, and then, all of a sudden, a voice from heaven will say, redeemed, or sometimes translated as saved. And it's in this moment, Gretchen's final words will be spoken to Faust. She says, Heinrich, I shudder to look at you. And, of course, this is maybe her attempt to try and save, in some ways, Faust, and then she dies. She will come back at the end of part two um, to, to help guide Faust. In, we have to think about Beatrice at that moment and Dante in the Divine Comedy. Okay. Well, that's the end of part one, guys. And Mephistopheles has not yet won Faust's soul, right? But Faust has begun to learn, we might say it for that way in your notes, the power of love, the importance of spiritual responsibility. But he's not yet redeemed, right? He still has not found happiness and fulfillment, and he's uh, and, and he's uh, you know still needing more uh, learning. And obviously, he's on the right track, but a long ways off. Now, the second part we don't read, but in the same way that I said to you guys about the Divine Comedy, you need to know how Purgatory Paradiso wins, so that you know how Inferno has is going to make any sense. The same is true of Faust Part Two. It's very complicated poetry, German scholars have pointed out for a long time. It's, it's hard reading, it's hard going. But let's at least summarize it, just so you know what happens, okay? It's a, it's a part two is a five act kind of play into itself, all right? And uh, let's go through it. First of all, in act one, all of a sudden Faust uh, wakes up in a, in a field of flowers. His memory has somehow been wiped clean, and he's ready to keep going with his journey. Mephistopheles is dressed as a gesture in the emperor's court, and he suggests to the emperor, you know, you should get gold from under your land, and you should go to paper money as well. Now, it's going to cause some problems down the line with inflation issues. We got lots and lots of references in Act 1 to Greek mythology. The emperor will ask Faust to bring back to life Paris and Helen using magic. Mephistopheles... Um, will say to Faust, let's, uh, let's visit the mothers, these, um, these uh, kind of witch types, because Mephistopheles can't help. He's a, he's a Christian uh, devil, and we've got to go back in time to the classic, and we're going to get a lot of tension between um, classicism and, and ancient Greek thought and that kind of thing. Using magic, Faust will bring to life Paris and Helen, and immediately when he sees Helen, he falls in love with her, and he faints, right? Okay, thunder kind of helps that to happen. Faust We'll see in uh, Paris and in Helen, we might say like Buddha does, the archetypes of human perfection. Act two of part two, we're back to Faust's soul study. So in other words, it's almost like we come full circle. Uh, Nicodemus has replaced uh, Wagner as the helper because Wagner has now replaced Faust as the professor. So there's a bit of irony here. There's this graduate that shows up. This is the student from part one who had that conversation with Mephistopheles. And now he's got his degree, his diploma, he's all conceited. Um, he's arrogant, he argues with Mephistopheles, and of course Buddha is, you know, um, in many ways ridiculing this idea, right, of the, the, um, that reason should reign supreme and all of that. Wagner then is going to create this little man, uh, homunculus, we think about um, Shelley's Faust and uh, the monster of Frankenstein, and he creates this in his lab, and they have a conversation together with uh, Mephistopheles and Wagner talking to this homunculus, um, um, and then they uh, take Faust off to Greece. Okay, so we've got to have now the classic, uh, the classical rendition of the uh, Valpurgis Night, and Guth is going to be um, sh is going to be in many ways, I think, showing off here. No question, his his genius with language is true, and his knowledge is is really celebrated here. Um, and his love of, of uh, Greek culture, as well as all the classical allusions here. 
in, in many ways, I want to put I want you to put this in your notes at 3A. This is kind of the birth of T. S. Eliot's wasteland, I believe. That is to say, there's so much dropped in, and it's okay if you know all of these all these references. It's fine if you don't. Obviously, you're kind of lost. We're going to say the same thing in our study of wasteland. You'll you'll find our our, our lectures there at LearnStrong.net. Okay, the third act of the second part resembles in many ways writing down a Greek tragedy, right? And in many ways it is the attempt to kind of reconcile classical and romantic ideals with the modern, okay? As, as good as clearly trying to do at the end of his life, at the end of, of, of Faust II. We're in the kingdom of Sparta. This is shortly after the Trojan War. Helen and the Trojan women have been brought back. Mephistopheles will tell them, you know, you're about to get jacked. I mean, Menelaus is going to kill you for all the terrible things that you did. I do, I do know this northern lord, though, this will be Faust, who can help you out. And so Helen will go to meet Faust. And of course, here, very much like part one with Gretchen, we're going to have Helen and Faust together. Faust, however, now everything has kind of changed in terms of setting, and now all of a sudden Faust is like a German knight in the Middle Ages. You're going to have Faust and Helen fall in love. They're going to get married. They're going to go to the Eden of Arcadia. So here we are at another paradise, Eden-like place, um, a land that has no rules and has freedom. Faust and Helen are going to have a son, Euphorion, um, who is kind of the, uh, like, considered in many ways like Lord Byron. And Euphorion is going to try to fly. Um, he jumps off a cliff. Think of Icarus here, obviously. And he dies. And with his death... Helen will follow him and disappear. And this will be then another moment when uh, Faust will lose the woman that he obviously aspires to, to, to own or to be with. Part 2, Act 4, Mephistopheles tries to tempt Faust again, and this time Faust will refuse. He says, you know what, I'm going to do something right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some land, I'm going to reclaim this land from the sea, and I'm going to show that I can fight against nature. I'm going to do something for other people. And Mephistopheles will point out, well, if you're interested in doing that, there's this emperor that we helped before, and because of his currency inflation, he's now got to be at war. You can see, obviously, the, the debate about economics as it relates to, to, to war. And let's help him, right? So that way, you can get, that way you can get some land. Faust will say, dude, I'm no warrior. And Mephistopheles will say, don't worry about it. And he brings in these biblical heroes, the three mighty men, who will represent youth, maturity, and old age. Faust will help the emperor win the battle, and then he's expecting a certain kind of reward, and his reward is this strip of land, coastal land, most of it underwater, that's pretty much worthless. And there's all kinds of points being made, politically speaking, that I just won't get into here. Finally, Act 5 of Part 2, Faust's project is working. However, we got two old people in uh, Philemon and, and Baucus. Um, and, and you'll maybe remember from your study of Greek mythology, these are two, the names of two old peasants who uh, entertained, showed Xenia hospitality to uh, Zeus. But they don't want to sell their land. They live in this little nice little cottage. They're poor, but they live in this cottage. And Faust is offering them unbelievable amounts of money, and they won't, they won't do it. They won't, they won't take it. Well, Faust is now more than 100 years old, we learn. He tells Mephistopheles and the three mighty men, you know, I really wish somebody would take care of this and just evict those guys. And, uh, and, and the reasons here are, are very interesting. It's not so much that he dislikes the, the two old people in uh, Philemon and, and Balkis, but rather their simple life. He, he, he wishes that he could live maybe a simple life like them. He resents it in some level. Well, Faust learns that Mephistopheles and these three mighty men went off to not evict, but to actually kill uh, um, um, the two old people and then burn down their cottage on top of it. And it's at this moment that Faust is kind of overcome with some remorse and with some anger. And this is kind of the first time that he begins to actually take responsibility for his actions. It's taken him a long time. We're at midnight. We have four hags, or witches, that will accost Faust out of the fire. It comes out of the cottage that's on fire. The four witches want, debt, distress, care. The third one, care, um, um, is, is going to plague him and warns that death is coming, and he, he can't ignore, he can't ignore care. Faust tells care that he has learned something, that aspiration um, for what can be attained, that is what humans should do, is aspire for what can be attained as opposed to what cannot be attained. Care will breathe on Faust and blind him. And immediately we think of Tiresias, we think of Oedipus, and those other mythological moments when blindness it's that one thing, right, where perspicacity or insight happens at the moment of blindness. It's always fascinating, right? 
Uh, but Faust still refuses to give up on his building project, right, and um, his service to others and, uh, and, and hoping to build a better world. We then have, uh, this is really bizarre, we have uh, Lemur's, uh, these monkey ghost kind of things that start digging on Faust's grave, but because he's blind, he thinks that they're digging the, more on the building project, and at that moment, Faust feels really pleased. I've done something to help other people. And it's at that moment that he whispers about the future. Stay moment thou art so fair. And he collapses and he dies. At that moment, Mephistopheles thinks that he's won Faust's soul, because that was the deal. But no. Faust has actually learned the duty of self-surrender. And so we have angels that come down and pick up Faust's body and take it to heaven. Mephistopheles knows he's failed. And, of course, we learned that the power of love is greater than anything Mephistopheles could ever understand. And now we're at the end of the poem. we got a chorus that we'll be singing, and at the very end of the poem, it runs like this. What is destructible is but a parable. What fails ineluctably, the undeclared. Here it was seen, here it was action, the eternal feminine lures to perfection. The eternal feminine leads us aloft is sometimes how it's also translated. In other words, there is still hope. Faust, now he's not completely redeemed yet. He's going to continue his journey towards Gretchen. Think about Dante and Beatrice. Faust will be admitted to heaven, though, because of his positive, his spiritual attitude, right? His constant striving to try to be better. And that's the end of our poem. Now, quickly, let's critique. Using our big five, epistemologically, what do we learn in a poem like this? Well, it's the fallibilist position, right? The absolutist position won't work. I know, and I'm absolutely certain. No, that, don't, that won't work, because we know that you can obviously often be confused. But the relativist position, there is no truth, there is no morality, there is no fill-in-the-blank, whatever, uh, uh, no absolutes.